there are three organizations shown there. The University Safe Trans Office. Um, with my industrial hat, I am chairing an industrial association, Safe Trans, Safety and Transportation. In that context, we work in particular on um, identifying key priorities which must be solved for type homogenization of autonomously driving cars. So we have a working group of people in the industry, all the OEMs and tier one suppliers, but we also take into account recommendations from the aerospace domain and other sectors as to how to deal uh, with the problem of type certification for highly autonomous cars. On the other side to the right, as a university professor, I've been chairing a uh, large-scale research project on automatic verification and analysis of complex systems, and there we have been pushing the development of formal methods for exactly that topic. And so you will see both elements of this represented in this talk. And on the left side, that's Office is an Applied Research Institute. Uh, I'm chairing the Transportation Division where we are doing joint projects with industry, in particular exactly on this <coughs> topic of testing highly autonomously driving cars. So um, let me give you a few words of motivation. Um, a few words, <laughs> some words. Uh, and I'm going to have a technical focus here on work which was coming from the AVAX project. I was quite surprised to see that a PhD student from Bernd Finkbeiner, who has been one of the key collaborators with whom I've been working in this foundational research project, is here. And this is work jointly with Bernd Finkbeiner. And then I'll look into a more applied test bed, which comes from the office side, on <coughs> a test bed for assessing advanced driver assistance systems, and then I conclude. So the one question which has been troubling my mind during the last uh, three years, is it safe to deploy highly automated cars? And it's, uh, I'm, I'm taking here simply um, a customer perspective and I found it very interesting to see that uh, different from the, uh, even in, in the US, if you look over here, only 27% would consider it to be very likely to be buying a highly autonomous car, 25% likely, and 18% uh, very skeptical. If we look into the German situation, we have 21% who would be very skeptical. And <clears throat> let's say my statement about this right now would be it's a good to have good reasons to be skeptical. Um, we all, we all, meaning those who have been working in this area of highly autonomous driving, know a standardized classification of different degrees of autonomy. And we are going, um, <clears throat> the, the, the key parts which are currently, say, the focus of R&D, but also product developments are on conditional automation and we are seeing the transition for systems coming up towards high automation and then up to full automation. And if you see over here this black line, this says something about the key qualitative differences between the full automation and all the other classes and that even for level three, the human driver is still seen as a fallback part. So, <clears throat> People are relying in their safety case for a highly autonomous car on the fact that the driver will be able to take control under a specified amount of time. Current discussions are in the order of some seven, eight, nine seconds. Even if the electronic system is giving up and saying, I don't understand the world in which I'm moving, I cannot do this anymore, please driver take over. Okay? So the challenge then is for the OEMs and tier ones to make sure that during these seven seconds, the car is still doing something safely. And that's a real, real challenge. It means, okay. And if we go down in the, or if we go up in these classification schemes, ultimately the, the <coughs> we will 
uh, there will be uh, driving modes where the driver is not needed at all, like the highway chauffeur system, which is going to be about introduced in the market in some two years. And ultimately, uh, we will see this down here, and I guess time projections about when this will happen are really highly disputed uh, among the different people in industry. So <clears throat> over here, the car is supposed to be autonomously driving on highways or automatically parking the car uh, or automatically driving in low-speed, restricted urban areas, but then the driver still has to come into the picture. And if you are over here, okay, so already at this level, the key point differentiating this from the classical uh, situation which we have on the market is that the system has to do the complete monitoring of the environment of the car. It has to understand the world around its uh, around the car to such a degree that it can autonomously take decisions as to what actions to take. Okay, So that's the key, key point which we have to face, and that's the problem uh, for testing. <coughs> so why is this a cause of concern? It's a cause of concern because we have a disruptive technology change in driving. <coughs> The disruptive, whenever you introduce into a stable system something disruptive, it means that all the background knowledge you have been using before in engineering such systems, you have to throw away because suddenly something completely new is on the road. And we have three disruptive things happening here. The change of responsibility, that's exactly what I said before, in that here the driver is no longer really in care, but only as a fallback solution. And the system itself is taking complete responsibility. So, so we have this change of responsibility. We have the physical change in that now the car has to have all these capabilities, let's say cognitive capabilities as a human to analyze traffic situations and make driving decisions. And we have a, a situation where the, um, these decisions, these perceptions, will most likely not be able to take them based on the equipment which is on the car itself, but will rely on the integration of the vehicle as part of a mobile network, which is giving up-to-date uh, information, uh, which is processed then in these autonomous decisions. So, we have these derived disruptive elements. From the change of responsibility, then the <coughs> um, societal expectation is, well, the, the car then better should meet these higher safety expectations. We also have many cases built for autonomous driving, built on the fact that perhaps technology can do this better than we as humans, after all, Many of the traffic uh, accidents happen because of human errors, so we expect overall an increase in safety. Um, <clears throat> but the other, another derived requirement is then that we have to have um, to build, and I will make the case for this much more, a, ultimately a system where we permanently observe how the technology we are deploying in the market is actually behaving and build up a kind of meta-learning curve in trying to understand constantly the complex environments in which cars are moving. So <clears throat> on the system side here, um, the challenge to implement basically our brain's capability in perceiving the environment into the car calls for really uh, new and high-performance components and we are currently actually in a state where we are limited by the processing power we have in achieving the level of actual observations uh, which we need for safety driving. We would like to go further than where we are over here. The fact that we need to integrate with cloud, with roadside infrastructure, means that there is a need of the OEMs 
to agree on an open uh, EE architecture and in particular also on standardized interfaces to the network and the infrastructure communication. Of course, there have been many activities going on there, car to x communication, etc. But this goes beyond this in the level of information which has to be exchanged and which must be part of the <coughs> standardization process. And in order to follow this derived requirement, we have to implement, and this requires regulatory efforts, a common observation and validation platform. Here is an elaboration of this part here of the disruptive element, sorry. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture coming from Bosch. So if you look into this complex picture over here, the main point I'd like to discuss is the delineation line between this part, which is the in-car functions, and this, which is the back-end layer where now critical information coming from, for which are demanded, which are necessary for autonomous driving, are no longer realized in the car itself, but require this back-end communication. So <clears throat> in the car, you will have all the capabilities for perception and cognition and actuation based on a sort of kind of, let's say, baseline system, which offers braking system, etc. Uh, capabilities over here. Uh, but the key, say, elements which distinguish class 3 from class 2 SAA systems are instantiated in this level over here. And they do require, for instance, for perception, uh, the capability to share the views of the real world with other cars or to import information about cloud, etc. <coughs> so this is the one disruptive element so we have to get a agreed, standardized, for instance, safety case and security architecture across then all these dimensions, and in particular then including uh, these parts over here. <coughs> so we have seen tons of projects uh, driving this topic of highly autonomous driving, like in Europe there was the PREVENT project over here, and you have all seen these pictures about car-to-car -car communication and, and how that extends the electronic horizon of a car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So <clears throat> when we are discussing what we build into the car, we are going to make some type of abstractions of the real world and ultimately perhaps end up with this abstraction of the real world. Okay. And so it's a key decision in autonomous driving to find out exactly what parts of the real world are necessary for having safe autonomous driving. Is that level of precision sufficient with which I can estimate the position? Is it sufficient that I forget the fact that this is uh, not a bicyclist, I just see something moving here, or do I have to have exact classifications? Uh, do I need to know whether this is a child or an elderly person? Uh, do I need to know whether this is an emergency vehicle or not, et cetera, et cetera? You can ask tons of such questions. So this decision of what has to be perceived in autonomously driving cars or not is a key decision. And we know from the avionics domain how key this is. This was a crash of an aircraft which uh, landed and crashed ultimately into the uh, physical structure at the end of the runway. Why did it do so? Because when the pilot tried to activate reverse thrust, this was not possible. Why was this not possible? Because in previous accidents, reverse thrust had been inadvertently activated during cruise flights. So they, the <coughs> Federation, the FAA, uh, demanded that aircrafts have are only allowed to activate reverse thrust if they are on ground. So you need this concept of being on ground. So that concept has been included in the parameter of this world model, but it has been translated into a form which is correct for most situations, in that two tons weight, that's 
good for this aircraft here, are resting on the wheels. But it doesn't work in situations where you are, have a particular type of landing maneuver, which happens if you have strong side winds, because then you have to kind of fly in from the side, and then the, wheel, the weight of the aircraft will only be on the left wheels, not on all. So because of that, the aircraft believed it was still in air, and it did not do this. <coughs> so these are the kinds of challenges which we have to solve in actually a much more complex world than in avionics. So this is um, what I call the system engineering challenge. So we are building a physical system like a highly autonomous system, and we have to identify what real-world aspects could potentially impact my system in a way that endanger its proper functioning. And that's a, <coughs> a real difficult problem. And the, even if you have identified this, even if you knew exactly what aspects are relevant, I still have the testing challenge. So I assume I have a complete environment model, which includes all the artifacts of the real world around the car. But then how can I possibly test that an autonomously driving car will never endanger safety in all possible environmental traffic situations? You all know from that our dear colleagues in, in automotive industry say there's just no way where field testing could be done. We need something else. We are way out of tra traditional uh, methods for verification, quote, unquote, by field testing as a method for type acceptance. And we need to go to a new process, which still then guarantees the same level of safety which we would otherwise have for, safety, uh, for this <coughs> field testing. And if you look into particular this SAE level three, there is this argumentation, well, if the system fails, there's always the driver, okay? So how can we test, how can we possibly test if we have a, even if we have a complete environment model that a driver can take control in all these possible environmental situations when the system gives up? Okay. And you have to answer all these questions before deploying cars, such cars, into the market. So in the avionics industry, <coughs> this problem of, so to say, defining the parameter of the world model and the completeness of the testing has been addressed by installing a learning process. So whenever there is a flight incident, then this is analyzed by the FAA, and then <coughs> ultimately this results in a situation where the um, aircraft manufacturer is required to identify those process steps in which the potential for such an incident should have been detected. And then the existing models, like the environment models, or the, in particular the representation, the aircraft say the autopilot has about its environment has to be extended to deal with these real world artifacts. And then, <coughs> so that one can then um, build into measures into the aircraft to mitigate this particular design of these unidentified systems. And then the safety processes have to be rerun to demonstrate the resilience against root causes for such hazards. That's industrial practice. And basically, my firm belief is we need a similar thing for autonomous driving. Please. So in this case, uh, what defines an incident? An incident is a near crash situation where it's still avoided. Of course, accidents are also analyzed, but also so the incidents are... Pilots, so the operators take... The, 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 okay, so you are in a situation where um, you are in a near crash situation. And you can only avoid it by, let's say, doing uh, unorthodox maneuvers. This is a picture showing how, on one side, the safety of aircraft have been, has been improving over generations, first generation, second, third, fly-by-wire generation with auto throttle, auto brake, etc. Uh, over here, an envelope protection capabilities over time. 
If you look into the steady state situation, these are here years of operation, like 30 or 40 or 50, then you see that the new aircrafts perform drastically better in terms of fatal accidents per 1 million departures than the first generation. So that's fantastic. Safety has improved. But take a look at this part of these curves. This is, so to say, the break-in period of new aircrafts. And in this break-in period, you see that the um, first generation, I, th I think it's over here, the second generation is over here, and with increasing generations, the peak goes higher and higher and higher. Thus, why, while we are lowering the number of fatal accidents per one million departure in the steady state, we have a increase in such accidents in the, uh, it's very tragic to call this, not really appropriate to call this a learning curve, but that's actually what hap what's happening. Now, this is coming from not being able to completely foresee, given the complexity of these systems, all the possible situations in which an aircraft could be. If you look into the space of possible situations in which an autonomously driving car can be, that's, let's say, two orders of magnitude more complex. Okay. Can we learn from the field? Oh, no, please not. Okay. So we have a real issue. There is an industry which is known for its safety culture, okay? and even they have not managed to cope with this complexity problem in, in the sense of avoiding these peak situations. Here we have an industry which is moving into new territory, and what do we do? Okay, so even in aerospace, the learning curve approach fails at the point of introduction of a new aircraft generation whenever you have disruptive changes. And I told you about the disruptive changes which we have in highly autonomous driving. <coughs> so certainly the increasing degrees of automation with respect to the SAE scale necessitate rigorous method for the qualification and certification in particular of the used world models that is the internal representation the car has about its environment. So that's the bad side. Is there hope? Well, perhaps. Um, so the question is, and now we are challenged as people working more on the theoretical foundation side, wouldn't it be great if we can decompose the overall safety case into arguments which are formally verified, scalable, model-based, etc., so that there is only a small part which then has to be made explicit as assumptions on the physical system so that we could actually give a formal argumentation that given all these identified assumptions on the physical system and given the verification evidence which are actually established formally, then we can show that the overall system is safe, provided then that the remaining field testing shows that these assumptions are verified. So we are, so to say, trying to, to drastically uh, reduce the, the space of situations which must be handled in field testing in this overall line. We are not today in a situation where we can say, yes, that's possible. But at least I think that's a possible avenue. Okay. So there are many things which have to be done in this direction. And I, I wanted originally to give three parts in the talk, but then I said, okay, that's just nonsense. Let's just focus on one. So, and this deals exactly with this question of picking the right parameter of what the car has to see. This is coming from joint work with Bernd Finkbeiner as part of the AVAX project, and it's called Optimal World Models and Remorse-Free Strategies uh, Using Formal Synthesis, and I will explain all these terms in the presentation. So this is a challenge I want to address. Now, 
as a theoretician or from a theoretical perspective, I first have to, I will follow a standard approach and first reduce this problem to a much more um, simpler problem, as you will see. But the simpler problem, um, I think we'll have first evidences, will be sufficient to deal with the real world situation. Okay, so this is the question we want to answer. What real world aspects could potentially impact us in a way that endanger its proper functioning? So there are many questions which I would like to answer. Are all relevant real world artifacts part of my world model? That is, does my car see all, does my car understand all this? Does it have concepts for this? And again, even if I have concepts, can I actually observe this? Did I translate these concepts correctly into uh, information which I could obtain by sensor fusion? Okay, so I can actually observe these. Is there actually a way of formally characterizing what is relevant? And if so, wouldn't one then be able to determine, in this sense, optimal world models because they contain the minimal amount of information, but not more, which is needed for control. And <clears throat> then another question which goes into this um, strive to decompose what can be reduced to things which can be done in field testing. Can we characterize the environments into which our systems can be safely deployed? Okay. So what the car has as digital representation of its environment, I call a world model. So the car will have system variables, which are modeling actions under the system's control, such as setting of actuators, and will have environment variables, uh, which in typical control theory would correspond to the variables of the plant model. And in these environment variables, as usual in control, I would have disturbances, but also I have controllable environment variables, which I can thus influence by the system through the setting of actuators. <clears throat> so we are in the theoretical setting talking about an arbitrary set of environment models in each particular implementation in each particular car type, we will only see a finite subset of concepts implemented. And this choice of which subset of all the artifacts to be modeled is exactly that definition of choosing the parameter of the world model. For those which are not observed in the formal approach, I assign arbitrary evaluations to those which are in the different set over here. And we are in a theoretical setting where we are assuming only finitely typed variables. You could think of uh, some type of fixed point representations of the real values. And <clears throat> then because they are finitely typed, we can as well just assume that they are Boolean. So then what is a world model? Okay, so it's one side saying, what is my parameter? It has uh, different nodes, possibly infinite set of nodes. And at each node, I assign the set of evaluations of controllable variables, which agree on the variables within the parameter of the model. And for each transition, these are then caused by system moves, setting the system variables, and by disturbances. And again, this power set, power set construction simply comes from the fact that we are only observing a subset and the rest will be unrestricted. So all these different sets, which are on the power set of the power set, agree on the part which is in the parameter of the system. So here's a very simple world model. Suppose you want to build an advanced driver assistance system, which has to maintain a safe distance to objects ahead. Okay, we are on a highway situation, 
and <coughs> it has, we just have a two-lane highway, and it has a secondary objective, which is to avoid braking if possible. So in the simple model, then, sorry, we, we have uh, different disturbances which can come up, like there can be suddenly uh, an obstacle, uh, like whatever, uh, a piece of wood on the, on the highway, or I can have a tire burst, and to make this um, simple enough for the presentation, there's only one controllable action here, uh, which is braking. And the states of the simple world model here are distinguished then whether I am in a situation where there is a safe distance to the object ahead of the ego car, or there is uh, like a sensor seeing that an object has been detected, and then the car knows this. It's given to the car this information, and <coughs> then we have these transitions, which are possible by either disturbances, like here, or by either braking or not braking over here uh, between these different states. Okay, so in particular, because there, even if the their sensor says there is an obstacle, because we have a two-lane highway the obstacle could be on the other lane, so even without doing anything, I might be returning back to the safe state over here. But otherwise, if I don't break, then I will end up in an unsafe state, that is, if the obstacle was on my side. And even if I were braking, but there is a tire damage, then my braking would be ineffective and I would still be in an unsafe state. So, this model here shows that there are no winning strategies. And from the classical verification approach, where you say either I can show that the property is true or not, uh, our approach was saying we do not believe that formal verification in the classical sense is meaningful because there will always be situations in a cyber physical system where you cannot guarantee safety because you have these rare events which pop up like a crash. So we take this seemingly negative starting point as a positive basis for developing a theory which allows us to measure whether it makes sense to take a world model and then add one more artifact A. And we do so by comparing what we call the strategic capabilities of the smaller world model and the rich model, richer model. And in particular, if I am able with the richer model in comparable environment moves to more often win than in any strategy which I would be able to find in the smaller model, then I'm really, really happy. So the key question we ask is, if I am building strategies in the smaller model and this model, I know I cannot claim that I will be winning in both, but I can compare, if I take this world model here and this world model there, in comparable environment moves, can I build strategies here which allow me to win in situations where I couldn't do, do so in this other smaller world model. That's the key starting point of our theory. So here is a richer model where we introduced a new observation, the observation whether the car is on the left lane or on the right lane. And the disturbances then are whether the obstacle is actually on the left lane or not. Okay, and we still have this controllable action of braking, but we can also choose initially here in this simple example to just take the left lane. And the states are as before. Okay, so <clears throat> in this model here, you remember there was this non-deterministic action which allowed me to go back without braking to, in the simpler model from a... Um, Let's just go here uh, to the safe state without doing anything. In this particular model, this non-determinism is resolved in that if the obstacle is on the left side and I am on the left lane, I better should break. And similarly for the right side, if the obstacle is on the right side, then I should better break. Otherwise, if I don't break, then I become unsafe and still I have this disturbances which is uncontrollable, which can kill everything. 
Okay, so that's a richer world model, and it eliminates poverty. So you can argue that neither of the models actually will have winning strategies. Recall that there are two objectives, safe distance and only break if necessary, so to say. So a strategy which never breaks clearly doesn't work in either one because you can always end up down here. Uh, a strategy which always breaks doesn't help uh, because then I will violate the secondary objective because there are situations where I don't need to break, uh, like when the obstacle is on the other side, and so I, I'm not winning either. So and if I break, if and only if uh, I have a warning, uh, then the same argumentation uh, applies. So I give up trying to have a winning strategy and I can ask, can I compare these different strategies? And I can compare, and I would like to compare these strategies with respect to a concept which we call remorse. And this is intentionally chosen to be, we as humans find in certain situations that we experience remorse. I could have done better if I just had taken that, well, whatever street before, I wouldn't have run up into the traffic jam, etc. And also here, uh, the, the the intention is exactly the same. If you would be sitting in a car and this car is not remorse-free in its strategies, you as a driver would say, how could that car do this stupid thing? I knew that there is a better solution. And I would exactly like to avoid such situations. So I don't want to have the situation that another strategy can play better than I can. Okay, And this is exactly formalized by uh, this in comparable situations, I would like to be able to show that I can as, do as good as another strategy. And if that is the case, then I call this better strategy a dominating strategy. It dominates this other strategy here. So like S2 dominates S3. And that whenever S3, is, this is break always, is able to achieve uh, some priority, in this case like safety, then I can do as well, okay? because then there was not a tire burst situation, and this is the only uncontrollable situation, and if I have the strategy break, if and only work a warning, I would do the same. So the S2 is actually better because it avoids the unnecessarily breaking in a safe state where there is no warning. And similarly, you can show then that S2 dominates S1, and I'm not sure whether I really want to take the time to go through these argumentations. So, <coughs> and if, if you take this, say, uh, simple model over here, the conclusion is that none of these strategies will allow a dominant strategy over here. Okay? But if you take the richer model where you have more observations, then you actually will have a, uh, you can pick a remorse-free dominant strategy. So by adding this information, we allowed, we gave the synthesis tool enough information to avoid remorse situations. Okay. So, we start in our formal model with objectives given as LTL formula. They are prioritized. And um, we, we have this intuition that only a subset of the real world artifacts are required to define in this sense the best possible st strategy. And we cast this into this formal definition in that we say a world model is optimal if it allows to define such a remorse-free dominance strategy, which is better than all other strategies, not only in this world model here, but also if I take any refinement of this world model, any refinement, adding more and more information, still this one is optimal. Please. So here, um, so actually two questions. One is, um, mentioned that you can the, uh, augment or you know, uh, add to the world model by seeing like by adding propositions, additional mm -hmm. propositions. Yes. Right? Uh, 
is that the only thing that you can do, or are there other artifacts that you can add? So you have the same set of propositions, but maybe you add uh, more um, uh, transitions or something like that. Yes, this will also change the transition structure, typically. That's also a kind of artifact. That's also, yes. So formal definition is captured by the notion of refinement, which would also cover adding other transitions. Yes. And the second uh, question related to that is, <coughs> the underlying assumption here in the, in the theory that we know the superset of all possible propositions. So you can, to define optimality, you, you know the bold BE. You just don't know. You don't know. You don't know. It's an arbitrary set. You choose it arbitrarily, and you give all the, uh, and you deal with this fact that you don't know the exact parameter with giving arbitrary evaluations to all these. So you can extend. So I think your question can be posed like this: If I extend this bold VE to a larger set, does this change the optimality result? It doesn't. Okay. So then, um, if we want to, then maybe you're driving towards this. But if I want to. If my current world model is not optimal, if, how do we, um, is there a constructive way of, of coming up with an optimal world model? If we don't know the superset of the but it becomes. No, this is a test. Like this is a test, okay? And it's it's what you're asking for is, uh, let's say, a miracle. It's, it's saying, uh, please tell me exactly, uh, uh, you ask for an oracle, tell me that this is exactly the thing which I have to add. So this is why we need these learning processes. If you give me a particular parameter, I can say, this doesn't work. Yeah? But I cannot really tell you what I have to do in addition. A hint is, look at the situations where there are non-determinism in the model and see whether you need to have more observations in order to refine this non-determinism. But you do, you do have the objectives specified formally. Yes. So is there a way of... From, there are some things which are kind of trivial. Whatever you observe in the formula, you should better observe in the world model too. Yes. But, well. So <clears throat> if we have a world model and we have such an objective uh, specification of the objectives of the system given as a prioritized list of LTL formula, then we can automatically check whether this world model is optimal, and we can also then uh, synthesize the best strategy. Now, that's a tree automata construction. It would be nice to talk about this, but it would be, I would like to <coughs> go back to applications ultimately. Um, we call an objective specification admissible if it allows um, if there is a remorse-free dominant strategy. So you may ask in your LTL specifications things which you could not really implement, or let's say which would require the implementation to have an oracle which tells about the future. So take this very simple objective specification. You are driving in the highway, and you would, your objective is to take the next exit. You are on lane two, and you have a bad guy next to you on lane one. There is, this is the situation where there is no remorse-free, of course, no winning, but even no remorse-free dominance strategy, because whatever move you, you pick, like accelerating, it will be, could be can countered out, countered by the bad car by doing exactly the same. And then whatever move you take, he just follows you and blocks you from taking the exit. So in order to decide whether it's better, the point with remorse-free strategy means here you just have no way of deciding how to avoid a remorse situation. You will always, if you, if you choose to accelerate, you will have remorse because the other car is, uh, let's say, also accelerating and you are lost. If you choose to decelerate, the other car might do the same. So there is no remorse-free strategy here. <clears throat> if you would know that the other car would not accelerate in the next move, then you could build a remorse-free strategy. So if you have a formula which is not admissible, by you can actually analyze the system and ask, what information do I need to know about the neighboring system's near future 
so as to have remorse-free strategies. There is one part of the work which we have been doing, which has been exactly uh, talking about such promises about the future, and, and because this can easily be a cyclic thing where you then talk about more and more advanced futures, it doesn't work always. It only works if you have systems where you have an ordering relation, say by priority, or where in a particular situation like this one here, the ego car has priority, then you can compute the minimal set of promises this system has to give to S so as to make S the, uh, the objective specification of S admissible. So, like, tell the ego car one step ahead whether you're either brake or accelerate before reaching the exit. And it doesn't have to be the next step. You just say, you tell which step you do this. So you can define the least restrictive promise S prime has to make for S so as S can achieve <coughs> its ob uh, so that the objectives of S are admissible. And then this could be implemented by using car-to-car -car communication and everything which you read in the literature about cooperative or which you see coming up about cooperative driving is exactly about this. You need to know information from other cars how to handle certain situations. <clears throat> okay, so we know that in general we will not have winning strategies, but then... If I have an objective specification which is admissible for a given world model, then not only can I define or can I uh, synthesize a remorse-free dominant strategy, but I can also characterize the weakest assumptions on the environment such that if this environment meets this assumption, then that's actually a winning strategy. Now, <clears throat> this is, let's say, a theoretical result. Um, it will give, help you to give hints and practical situations as to what you would like to see. Uh, do I expect that this will be the way to avoid in general or, or to achieve in general winning situations not for practical applications? I see this more as a theoretical result. Anyway, <clears throat> this is um, introducing the notion of assumptions from a perspective under what assumptions can I be actually winning and um, um, <clears throat> from the uh, industrial perspective, I think generally this concept of contract-based design has been is key, will also be key for autonomous driving. So under which assumptions on the environment of the system can I actually be able to meet my objectives? And you could ask this up to the different priorities. Under what assumptions can I be safe? That will be the highest priorities. Under what assumptions can I be energy efficient? Under what assumptions can I also meet this driver's request to expect uh, to be in, in that city at that point in time? Please. And how do you find the weakest one? So how do you even define the weakest? Oh, weakest is uh, the most liberal. But like, what if you have two sets of assumptions, like one depending on the velocity and then the other one depending on something else? And how do you even compare them? Uh, the... Uh, um, they would be now this is actually uh, if <clears throat> the, the fact that there is a unique weakest assumption means that you do not have incomparable sets um, okay. so in the model we have to we have to make sure we can compare the assumptions the set of assumptions we get from the environment because we could model the environment in a way that not comparable, right? like then you would not have an admissible formula with respect to a fixed world this is, this is with respect to a fixed world, yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> in general, then, it makes sense to document these assumptions, and then you have a contract, assumptions, and guarantees, which is where the guarantees are just the objective uh, specifications. And <clears throat> for the industrial applications, it makes a lot of sense to distinguish two types of assumptions, this is only methodology. This is not really theory. Strong assumptions and weak assumptions. So <clears throat> this is something which you put into the context of product liability. If I deploy, let's say, a highway chauffeur in a situation where on the track the car is running, there are moving construction areas, 
and I've been testing before my system only in such situations where this will not be dealt with, then I, the OEM will not take liability if that is written down in the manual of the car. So among the many assumptions where you have winning strategies, uh, in particular the, the in, in an industrial process, you would single out those assumptions which must be guaranteed at the activation time of the system. And these relate to both, let's say, they all typically relate to the health state of the car, what sensors are working, how, the communication capabilities, but then also on the, um, let's say, lighting conditions which might uh, force you or which will stop object recognition uh, of, comp of critical objects. So when you design such a system, characterizing such strong assumptions is an essential part. And in the subspace which then remains, you will have typically weak assumptions for talking about different conformance levels or different degradation levels and what is still achievable when there is um, whatever one failure, one sensor system failed, but still you have redundant failures, or what will be the level of conformance which I can still offer at this point in time. <coughs> so in highly autonomous driving, to make sure that we have a sufficient level of the real co of coherency between what is actually happening in the real world and in the digital model scene, one key strive we have been discussing and pushing with industry is to find conditions which would assure such a level of coherency and characterize these as strong assumptions, meaning that you have to integrate into your car monitors which constantly supervise these situations and which simply deactivate such highly autonomous driving modes if you are in a situation where <coughs> this is uh, violated. So these must be reflected as monitors in cars which deactivate the system if any of these conditions are, are found. Okay. <clears throat> and this is actually something which people uh, have been using in the safety community in the safety community for years, years, years. So the space of possible environment models is here reduced to the space of possible failures on the on the system where people distinguish endogenous failures and exogenous failures, like for aircrafts, let's say there is suddenly a shear wind or there is a, an ash cloud coming up. These would be external failure modes and then internal failure modes, which have to be covered by redundancy, etc. So whenever you design an aircraft, you have a very clear failure hypothesis under which the system is guaranteed not to reach top-level hazards, which are coming from the system-level hazard analysis, and these failure hypotheses are nothing but assumptions. You say, I, I'm guaranteeing that top-level hazards will not be reached if I have these failure hypotheses. And I'm emphasizing this point because the community which has developed the best methods to actually explore this inherently um, complex space of possible situations which could endanger my system is the safety community. So all the methods which have been used there will be helpful to identifying additional artifacts going back to your question, Sanyet. <coughs> so that's some look into theory and how that could help. Um, <coughs> just to, to, to briefly state this part, there, there is an ongoing project um, together with um, the DLR in Braunschweig, which is a um, say more applied research institute with the central domain of automotive where we are exploring these synthesis approaches in the formal synthesis approach uh, project that's but this is future work so in the meantime we have been looking into a virtual test bed for ad assessing advanced driver assistance systems and this is answering or trying to answer the testing challenges so let's assume we have a complete environment model how can we then possibly test that an autonomously driving car will never endanger uh, the safety in all possible environmental and traffic situations? But also this SAE level three testing challenge, how can we possibly test 
that the driver can take control in po all possible environmental traffic situations when the system gives up. So <clears throat> given the time frame of this talk, I can only sort of say sketch to you the ingredients of this environment. And here is a, a picture which describes all the elements which go into uh, this environment, in particular what type of models. So a driver will have to take driving decisions like merging or following a car or braking. Okay. The driver is represented by this box over here, uh, which is a cognitive architecture. It's a three-layered cognitive architecture, which is having an autonomous layer where we mimic the capabilities of us as drivers to kind of do the lane keeping automatically. Uh, there is an associative layer where we are taking exactly these decisions uh, as, as humans, when to change lane and uh, when to brake and whatever. And there is a um, planning layer up here, which is currently not used there, which would be for overall, uh, say, mission control. And the, <clears throat> these uh, layers are implementing strategies for achieving goals, like I would like to, say, exit the highway, or I would like to enter the highway in the combination of uh, breaking this overall goal in, into a sequence of driving decisions, but which are then implemented by the autonomous layer. And to this end, we consult our memory, and the memory is in particular giving us a state of the situational awareness the driver has about the distance to other cars, uh, its speed, uh, what the, whether the distance is too close, etc. And these um, green um, objects here in their height represent the uh, strengths of beliefs about environmental artifacts which are given in the memory here and on which then these different layers are, um, uh, these different uh, decisions on the associative layer and autonomous layer are uh, um, guided. So this memory itself, the representation of what will be in the memory is coming from models which describe how we perceive the environment through all med uh, modalities, uh, visual, uh, haptic, uh, or acoustic, and then all our motoric capabilities are modeled over here. And uh, this is just showing one example of where we were discussing what type of modality one should use to give what type of clue in what situation. So with these types of studies are here. But the key point is that this here is a empirically validated model of drivers uh, and these models are built for different types of situations, like for the highway chauffeur, which would involve all these activities of merging, car falling, braking, um, overtaking other cars, and exiting. And <clears throat> then this architecture here, so here we are interested in modeling the performance of the driver in, in, in actually achieving different goals. And we can do so with different levels in the SAE classification about what level of assistance we would like to do. And we put this driver model into a simulation environment where the, we have a prototype system of the advanced driver assistance system and then a complete model of the environment uh, situations where the car is driving, including then also a vehicle dynamics model. So in this setting, we have, again, a virtual test driver model, which is empirically validated model of driver behavior in complex dynamic situations. And <clears throat> in, in particular, also including the interaction with the assistance system. There's still some more work which need, we need to be doing here. And this model can allow us to treat with the typical behavior of drivers, but also with drivers which are, let's say, in a distracted state or in a stressed state, and we can actually measure uh, using our experimental set up such situations um, and take these into account, let's say, how stress levels influence driving behavior, how fatigue influences this, etc. And they are then put on a virtual test track, which allows a holistic real-time co-simulation of this test, virtual test driver, the assistance systems, the vehicle, and traffic and then can do an online predictive assessment with respect to both safety and controllability in different situations. For the left-hand side, the virtual test 
tribal model. What sort of formal models do you think are um, potentially applicable there? Um, the, um, let's see. This associative layer is modeled in a rule-based framework. And in the lower layer, we have been both using differential equations and um, we have been using also um, statistically learned models uh, generated automatically. So both are, make sense in our... Combination of many different kinds of models. Yes. Mm -hmm. then how do we then um, <clears throat> do I have? So um, let, let me just say a few words here. So there are analysis techniques <coughs> integrated here. And um, <clears throat> one point dealing with this enormous complexity is to, to ask, can we reduce? Oh, okay, let's go back one big quick. In this community, I should perhaps start here. We use statistical model checking. And we use for this a particular variant of temporal logic, um, forget about robustness, this is too technical, which allows us to measure how far we are away from falsifying a formula. So by being able to measure whether a trajectory is way off or shortly off or way safe or only hardly, barely safe, we can assess the criticality of the system with respect to reaching its objectives expressed in this logic over here. And then we are trying to drive the system into states with simulation where the criticality is high, because these are the things which you would like to test. Okay? Am I about to have uh, such a um, violation coming up or not? And what I would like to see, we actually specify in a visual logic. This has been... Uh, designed to make it easy for, say, um, people in the uh, concept phase of designing such systems to write down in what traffic situation should the car do what and what type of communication should there be with the user. And we are actually using this also for test case generation then uh, in uh, and, and driving the simulation. So it's a partial answer. So the combination, the answer is we take into account we, we try to drive the simulation into uh, situations of high criticality, and we, uh, we try to cover all the, um, let's say, boundary cases which are coming from the visual logic uh, specification for what the system should do. And we have been evaluating this with a, a model for an SAE Level 3 uh, highway chauffeur with lane keeping, takeover, advanced ACC, etc where we have assessed different types of information passed to the driver um, in, in different situations. So I don't know whether the video animation will work here. So this is uh, about a highly automated lane change assist. And the, this is an example of the type of visual specification language we would use, which is a variant of live sequence charts. If any one of you have heard this before, kind of 90% turn to the left, 90 degree turn to the left, where each of these um, this depicts one predicate on a traffic situation, and it depicts how this traffic situation evolves over time, and it depicts on what type of information you would pass to the like to pass to the driver, with what modality, like you, whether you would like to project a head-up display, <coughs> or whether you are going to give, uh, let's say, haptic information like forces put on the steering wheel or uh, on the acceleration pedal and to communicate with the humans. And <clears throat> this has been then leading to a design of a system which then does this automatic uh, change where the level of automation is indicated here in different colors. And here, so the it's a system where still the driver has to give a consent to the overtake maneuver in, in this situation. Um, <clears throat> when the driver is not reacting to this request to agree to a maneuver, then actually the uh, a safe uh, minimal risk maneuver will be performed where the car will be taken to the site of the, uh, <clears throat> of the highway 
And so here the driver is alerted that he should react, and because he is not reacting, then the car takes fully over responsibility and performs this minimum risk maneuver. So here you see that the driver is first asked to confirm that this should be done, and uh, please say yes, and we are getting closer and closer to this car ahead. And as we get closer and closer to the car ahead, the driver is not responding, so the car says, okay, I have to take control autonomously and then <coughs> stop the car safely um, without interfering with the rest of the traffic. So that's the direction which we want to go to build a virtual test bed. It's, uh, let's say, a consensus in at least the companies in Germany I've been talking to that this is the way forward. Uh, and uh, we, a key capability of re reducing the complexity will be to have a, <coughs> we would say from the formal message side, declarative specification of the different environment situations and how the system should move. Declarative, which means that we can build, we can easily combine these specifications, we can detect inconsistencies, we can build complete stories over all covering all trajectories by, um, let's say, invocations of life sequence charts over time. So that's possible, and <coughs> that's the way we would like to go. So there are foundational contributions in this talk, talking about admissible linear time temporal logic formula, capability to effectively derive weakest assumptions. We can synthesize these. Uh, best-in-class, remorse-free strategies. <clears throat> there is a formal uh, definition of a visual specification logic for traffic scenarios supported by play-out, which we can use for automatic synthesis of monitors in model-in-the-loop, software-in-the-loop, hardware-in-the-loop testing, and actually also integrate into the car. And we use statistical model checking based on metric robust interpretation applied to human-in-the-loop models uh, to then gain sufficient, significant sufficient, sorry, confidence in, in meeting all the safety requirements in all these scenarios. So coming back to this original question, will we be safely using autonomous driving? So we are um, in industrial projects right now, two projects on the, this is on the national level, this is on the European level, where, where the elements which I have been describing to you, not the formal synthesis part though, are in a building block and building a test environment for type acceptance of highly automated vehicles. Um, this is a project which gets together all the uh, OEMs in Germany and tier ones. On the European level, we do this in a cross-domain approach, also with other, auto, with other um, transportation sectors and, and uh, aerospace. And in this working group, which I described as part of my role as a chairman of SafeTrans, we are going to give strategy recommendations for testing and safety and development process for highly automated systems, which I don't have the time to go through. But um, anyway, they will be publicly available uh, from the website of SafeTrans. So the projects which are beyond what I was talking are, there are two foundational projects. Uh, this has been going on for some 12 years, 30 million euro, and this is like a f six or seven million project uh, going on the last two years, Center for Critical Systems Engineering, and many industrial projects which have been going into this. Thanks. <laughs> Please. The framework you've been describing sounds quite deterministic. Um, mm -hmm. How do you deal with the learning systems that are really non deterministic? Are you talking about the, the part with the virtual test bed or the, the part with the uh, synthesis? In, in, in either one of them. How, how do you deal with those, that further level of uh, unpredictability? Um, so learning algorithms um, are in place and will be in place. They are in place in all um, <coughs> object identification algorithms. 
and we are working with the industry in actually mm, quantifying uh, with what probability, with what level of confidence can we in a given environment assumption um, guarantee that an object which is on the street can be identified by such algorithms. Um, are they non-deterministic? Uh, yes. And the more we are able to understand the environmental conditions under which we can give such confidence attributes, the better. For the environment situations where we cannot make such a quantification, we must disengage the system. That's the only way forward. And this way we can make it deterministic. So the approach would be there. Characterize those lighting conditions, for instance, or road surface conditions um, <clears throat> under which the learning algorithms used for object identification can be proven to have a sufficiently high confidence. And <clears throat> integrate monitors into the car, which are supervising these conditions. If these conditions are not there, disengage the system. There's learning and learning. Learning in the future may mean, and that's to me not coming in the next 20 years, perhaps in 25 or 30 years, that <coughs> this <coughs> learning cycle, which is underneath the recommendation, which I haven't been really able to show, where we <coughs> analyze near incident situations by a trusted body and then understand what additional, let's say, real world artifacts we have to integrate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where that learning process will be happening automatically in the car. Now that's a much, much more difficult uh, problem. And whether we are able to deal with such type of learning, actually I can't say right now, we, we are um, interested in a project largely with our colleagues at the University of Bremen to study long-term autonomous systems which integrate such features. We have some ideas, but this is just some ideas. Other questions? So maybe related to this point, uh, but more focused on common methods. Uh, in the broad area of probabilistic verification, you mentioned statistical model checking, but more broadly in probabilistic verification, if you were to point out one area that you really, if there were progress on, on that area, then it would really have a high impact here, what would that be? There is right now, I think, <clears throat> Um, an increasing level of interaction between the learning community and the model checking community. And that's the area where I would expect the most benefit. There was a workshop in China um, last, I think some two weeks ago, exactly on that topic, uh, where <coughs> this kind of need of the interaction was, I mean, this was the topic of the workshop. And um, from our university, Martin Frenzle is the key guy who has been driving this. Kim Larsen was there. I, I forgot the other people. So I think that's the direction which is uh, most prominent. Uh, <clears throat> there is another part which is um, uh, certainly relevant for this topic area. These are, let's say, efficient methods for forward reachability analysis in uh, <clears throat> Nonlinear systems and then nonlinear probabilistic systems because we have to predict the future in order to decide what to do and you have to do this online. So 